welcome to Society 2045 for 80 Talks. And today we have the beautiful Eleni Favro from Brazil joining us. And uh, we're going to ask some questions about uh, what she thinks should be the future of, of work, the future of humanity, the future of our civilization as we move forward. Uh, Eleni has been working in some of these areas, and uh, I'd love to uh, pry into some of her thoughts on this. Uh, Society 2045 is a community of people that has for its mission to um, discover what everyone is thinking about in these movements um, towards what the future will bring and how we are contributing to that future. Welcome, Eleni. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Jose, for the invitation. Um, um, so tell us a little bit about um, what kind of work you've done and, and where you're at in, in uh, the work you're doing. Okay, so I, I started my career as a lawyer, as a tax lawyer, and I made a transition of career six years ago to work with people. And one of my main wishes inside was to help people to have a better quality of work. So since then, since six years ago, I started focusing on this in many aspects. I started with philosophy, um, ontological uh, language, and then I, I knew the um, uh, integral thinking of Ken Wilber. I started uh, paying a lot of attention to the issue of emotions. So today I am uh, finally fin finalizing uh, an app uh, that uh, talks about emotions, especially in the workplace. And also, I am uh, giving consultancy on emotional intelligence and also uh, some aspects of uh, human behavior that need to be developed so you can work in collaboration, so organizational design, the human part, and understanding what kind of skills we have to develop in order for us to, to, to be able to collaborate. So that's the center of my work today. So uh, thank you for that. And, and have you given some thought to the, to the question we always ask, which is, what do you think the future looks like in, in the area that you've just described? Yes. Um, so I, I, was, I, I was thinking about this uh, subject since you made me the invitation about a month ago. And I was um, um, fixed in a, in a thought that I had previously. But yesterday, I was presented with one, one idea that I thought it was really amazing and I would love to share with you is that um, sometimes we're thinking about a future, like a, in, in utopy, utopies is the right word in English? Utopia. Utopia. Uh, we don't believe in the utopia future and we are afraid of uh, the dystopic future, but we're actually already living those. Uh, we already have people in the dystopic situation in the, the utopia situation. So. Um, Looking at the future is also understanding these extremes are coming and becoming and becoming uh, bigger in a, in a way that's going to reach and change more people. So thinking about the future and from this perspective is all, also thinking about uh, what's going on in the present and also the present, the present is going to, to lead us to the steps of the future. So thinking about the utopia and dystopia, I, I kind of have a sensation that uh, looking at the the world population as collaboration, we will have to learn how to collaborate together. Otherwise we will not be able to survive. I think it's going to be something, it's going to be needed in the companies, it's going to be needed because the technology is going to be so power that we're not, we're gonna have lack of jobs. So um, it's going to be needed because uh, we are going to, to have to learn to understand how we're going to deal with the climate changes and all the things that are coming from that and uh, possibly other types of attacks that we're going to feel as humans, not that we haven't caused it. So in the part of the human, human uh, center view, I do believe that we are going to develop a lot in a really good way. We're gonna get together better because we're gonna have to learn from our emotions. But I think that's a lesson that's gonna come from the pain, not from the love. Although all my work is let's try to do this from the love because I think the world is going to be a chaotic in 2045. I don't know uh, the power of um, organizations and governments to change that in a point. I personally have a kind of catastrophic view 
So this place that I am staying at here in Brazil, where I'm buying a house, I am building a house. One of the reasons because got a lot of water, and it's a beautiful place and everything. But I, I want to think about water. I want to think about what's the kind of challenges we're going to suffer as humans for being too many, and for being so deorganized. So. Utopia, we are going to be able to collaborate together and we're going to raise into really beautiful power communities. A dystopia, the world's going to be really chaotic by then. So that's, that's the sensation I have. We'll develop these humans and have a decrease of quality of life as resources and, and the quality of life. So what you've just described is, is living in, in paradise, which literally it is <laughs> there. Uh, but what happens to your colleagues who stay in Sao Paulo or um, any other major city in this in the world that don't have the privilege or the ability to to jump off into um, a place like High Paradise, where where you're building your home? Yes, I believe the home office is changing that possibility of people not having to have to be in big places so they can have a good work. Right, so I think that that is going to be, it's already starting to be a trend of people leaving the big cities and going to the, to the fields or to the countryside, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a movement that's already happening. I believe the cities, they will lose a, lot, a little bit of their power. I think there's still people who are going to be like doing the same thing at the same place because they don't understand and they're going to be really suffering a lot in big cities with lack of resources, with mental breakdowns and all these uh, troubles that the, the life in the city, in the big cities like Sao Paulo, not in the small cities, but I'm talking about places with a lot of buildings, you don't see horizon ever. And um, all of this poverty going around the place I have, uh, I live in Sao Paulo, I'm living here and in Sao Paulo making this transition. I saw since the beginning of the pandemic, we did have some homeless, but now it's so common to have families in the street asking for food. And I, I don't know what's that gonna be look like later. And and in some point, every time I look at these people in the city, in this really power uh, po poverty situation, I think, why don't you go to the beach? At least there you can pick up some fruits. Or you're not gonna starve. I don't know what these people are doing in the center of the city. <laughs> I really don't, because especially here in Brazil, we have a lot of space and other alternative ways of living. So. I think there will be a big migration and only the people with really big disturbs will stay. Uh, that's my impression at some point. And, and also the decrease of the level of the people maybe makes the city more easy Livable. to leave. But with that, yeah, I think there is a big crisis of um, real estate also and, and understanding already what they're going to do with all these empty buildings since the companies don't want to come back with a full day of um, work in present. So because of the home office so i think there are going to be a big crisis economic into the big cities they're going to burn out <laughs> so you're describing a big transformation i mean that's that's a huge change in the way that our societies work where yes most people live in big cities and they're moving away from those big cities into smaller communities what do you think happens at the organizational level what what does that look like from a um a future you know 23 years from now what what does that look like for you i i think that by then uh the organizations they will i i believe at some point like it happened with the the ozone layer at some point the governments will get together and start implementing some kind of change and the kind of impact the industries and organizations are going to to make I believe there are going to be some good changes, positive changes on that. So trace your impact, understand where your product is coming from. Is it uh, renewable or not? So I believe in this sense, organizations are going to be better because of demands of the, of the governments and laws and, and, and agreements between the countries. At the same point that I believe um, the organization, this, this positive impact thing can cling on the people and they can actually as they're learning to collaborate better, collaborate better. But I, I don't think that they're going to be huge organizations anymore because I think the tendencies we're decentralizing now, like, and uh, people will join a project here and then change there. I think things are going to be more fluid, not so a draw off organization, but rather so like cells that are exchanging information and resources also 
uh, to be able to uh, work with the ways of production uh, in a future with less resources and more difficulty to, to thrive. So I believe collaboration will get into the organizations. I think that we're getting to the maximum of the burnout. I think after that, they're just gonna die, you know? <laughs> so they are not gonna exist anymore or they find a new way to, to exist. When you say they, um, you mean organizations? They organizations, yes. Sorry, in Portuguese, it's no, it's, it's more uh, direct than when you say they, you mean organizations. But yes, I remember in the 90s, I had a friend and uh, his uncle had a lot of money. Like for in Brazil, a lot of money in 94 is that he was able to bring his wife uh, cousins and aunts and like 10 people to the US for the World Cup in 94 and for that as a Brazilian like wow you have dollars you know so he had all of these uh, uh, economic possibility because he had a lot of uh, paper uh, places where you you sell paper and pencil and um, the office papelaria? Uh, papelaria yes okay so an uh, office store office store um so he had a lot of these and he was making a lot of money and then internet came and people were saying you have to digitalize you cannot be like with that machine that dun, 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 and then dun, 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 the, the, the number you know and the, i don't know how to say that but i'm cash sure register understood me. a manual yeah. cash register yeah the manual one and like ding, ding, ding. <coughs> and then how the systems go and he was like i'm not updating anything i'm pretty good i dominate the market five years later he was broke and then he, he died actually he had a big depression and died like one year later and it was so you know um, paradox to see how him not adapting to change killed him so i think this is going to happen in literally and i think this is going to happen in many organizations i think it's about the only way to survive in um, in a more tense world and people as there will be better organizations with better quality to develop in people will look for those and not for the ones that are just you know killing them and i think these organizations that are still a lot about competing if they still be like this will be like this in 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 2045 they will have a lot of sick people unable to to make a good uh, strategic plan or follow it so what about uh, individuals that don't work at organizations yet say young people who are just leaving university now or young people who haven't really gotten deep into their careers, you're much closer to them than we are in age mm. uh, than the rest of us here. Um, how do you see that? How do you, what, what do you hear from them and, and from your colleagues? Uh, what I see is them creating this other place of organizing. I see now a tendency between my, the people I work with and, and younger people also is that I, I'm going to uh, open my own company where it's just me and I'm going to partner and make a project with you, partner, make a project with you. And then things are getting this because it gets more dynamic, because you change the subject, because you get new connections and all of these things really matter today. So I think we're going towards, they are going towards this way more autonomy, like um, comes with self-responsibility and, and awareness. But uh, I believe young generation are coming with a different, you know, mode and insight. And uh, they they naturally do that, and I think that's that's the tendency. I've seen many many friends like leaving leaving their their four or five people companies or or bigger opening a new one because they want to do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and change. So I think we're going towards that that place because it's yeah, people young people like to have fun, <laughs> they like the entertainment, and uh, they I think they're the world now it's it's uh, tangible for you to live with that. And you, you, you mentioned earlier that you think governments are going to play a role in, in making the change. Uh, now you're saying it sounds like also people are going to play a big role in making the change themselves. Where, where would you draw the line on those? Do you, do you think it's going to be more about people making the change or about corporations and governments making the change? Where, where do you think that's going to be? I kind of think it's the same point. Because the, the government will come from the lack of resources and the, the movement of the people also, it's the same thing that's generating the, the lack of resources, the fear, the necessity to get together in communities. So I think this fear is creating these two scenarios. Uh, the government will have to do something because, because they will start, I don't know, being afraid from, from themselves. It's like they think they're going to Mars and it's still like kind of far away, but the end of the earth not. 
So <laughs> it's it's like someone said to me one of these days, and I thought, wow, this is really amazing. It's so much easier for us to imagine the end of the earth, of life and earth, than the end of the capitalism. Because we don't trust that the governments are going to do something about it. It's going to be the interest of these five, 10 people because they just feel they're not touchable. But at some point, I believe that's going to change because um, there are some countries with a higher level of, of uh, consciousness that understands um, how systemic we are and the science is proving and proving and at some point is just going to happen. How do, you, how do you see the difference between, uh, say, a country like Brazil uh, and or the US, you obviously connect a lot with Europe and, and Americans. Mm -hmm. So you really have an understanding of, of, of where different people's heads are at. Do you see a difference in, in people's feelings, behaviors, motivations um, there in Brazil than you do in, in these, uh, say, North America or, or Europe? Yes, um, I think where you don't have a presence of the government, people have to get more creative and get together. So uh, we as Brazilians are really used to a lot of trouble. <laughs> and I don't know if abroad you get 10% of what's going on inside here. And uh, so I do believe in we, we see in communities people raising and getting together because they have to. And, and in places like Rio, uh, de Janeiro, you have a favela inside of the city and you have the beach with everyone. I think it's the most democratic place in the world is the beach of Rio de Janeiro. You see everybody there. The millionaire and the drug dealer, the guy from the favela, the funk one. It's like everybody is there and it's a really democratic place. And it's a place where we get in contact. So I got lost. What was the question? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the, the difference between what's happening and how how this is going uh, okay. to happen yes. in Brazil versus how it's happening in other countries. Yes, I think this as this is a movement that goes in the same way and they're like depending on each on, on upon another. I think places like Brazil, we will start with the community power earlier and places like the US, I don't know if the US, but Europe would start with the politics of reduction of um, impact earlier because US with um, with reduction is not, it's kind of your Weakness. Thing that, gets, uh, that gets the country yeah the, the weakness of the country i think it's like no 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 please not as a, a, a culture right this is not a critic but i see it um uh coming start in, in in europe and and a movement of the governments and i see starting in, in places like brazil a movement of the community I, i'm not sure about i've been only the, to the u.s once so i don't I only been to California. I could not talk. Yeah, it's, California country. is not like the rest of the. Country yeah, anyway. so <laughs> it would be like only going to uh, Brasilia and thinking that that's Brazil. But, yeah, I can relate to that. <laughs> uh, you, the thing we see a lot in the U.S. in the television in the movies. So you imagine what's New York like. You see a lot from the culture, but we, I have never actually been there to understand how do people you know, uh, relate to each other. What I thought it was really funny when I went to California is that when you get like this close to someone, they're already saying, oops, I'm sorry. It's like they popped your bubble out and you're not allowed to touch anybody. <laughs> Here in Brazil, we only say we're sorry if you bump into each other. It's like, sorry, sorry. If you run each other over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, otherwise it's like, give me a hug. <laughs> so we have that, that's different. That's the only uh, thing that, about the culture that I, I found. Um, yeah, I don't know how that relates to the rest. Well, it I mean, obviously the 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 more close people are, the easier it is for them to create community. Yeah, and so sure. physically close and intimacy of one kind or another is um, makes it for a much easier transition towards a community driven culture, community driven society. So I think what you've just sort of described there from personal experience is that um, in the US, we tend to be a lot less community driven, uh, though we even, even though we think we are um, in some cases, it's apparent from places like people like yourself who live in a, in a very intimate to say, possibly the, to call it that way, 
um, a society where people are that much closer to each other, that much more mm -hmm. connected to one another. I want to give an opportunity for everyone else to sort of jump in on questions. So I'm going to ask you one more uh, question, maybe two, uh, and then just uh, give everybody a heads up that we'll open up. The, uh, the, the next question for me is really one of, um, you've seen and you've experienced a lot of efforts to make this transition happen, right? And you're sort of, you're in the, in the middle of it um, there in, in Brazil, and you know many of the people that are involved in many of these movements uh, mm -hmm. within the, the community there. What do you see as um, something that will slow it down? I, I think we agree that this is going to happen. It has to happen. So it's not a matter of it not happening. But mm -hmm. uh, what will what kind of things do you think are going to get in the way to to, to, uh, to slow down the process or, or limit the 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 progression of this? Okay, um, I think the abstract answer is a lack of awareness, and the tangible answer it's uh, medicines for sleeping and depression and things like this that numb you, and the lack of people. Uh, the like the internet everything it's so available that if you don't want to think about yourself if you don't want to feel you just don't you get plugged and connected so i think the thing about the numbness numbness of internet and also from uh taking pills to sleep depression which i think it's really important in some cases and can really help someone to go from a phase to another but uh, not as a life uh, support system. I think there are really re rare cases of people who really cannot have produced some kind of chemicals, but the, the rest, they can do that from themselves. But I think the biggest obstacle is how distracted we get from what's, what's, what's important is the lack of awareness uh, in a big sense, comes from distractions and from um, med uh, medicines. And do and you think that... Um there is a difference in how the different generations are being distracted i don't know because today sometimes i want to talk to my grandma and she's in whatsapp talking to someone else and she's in the phone maybe the number of hours she spends there but it's already happening to be in the living room and two aunts my grandmother and my cousin and everybody's in the phone not talking so at some point that already happens. I don't know if in generations, what I think it's the new generation, they never experienced the world without it. So they don't know what's like. <laughs> so maybe that's what we have to teach them because they're gonna teach us a lot. They're just like getting so much info at so much young age, they're gonna be smarter than us. We just have to wish they're gonna take care of us in the future at some point. I don't know, because they're going to dominate everything pretty fast. But uh, I think our mission would be to tell them what's the world without it, what is the connections, what's the smile, what's the touch, uh, what is like to write, get an hour to write a letter, or be some days thinking about it, or experience the loneliness and the quietness. And maybe that's what we gotta teach. <laughs> so we're still humans, right? At some point, because they never saw it. I think my generation was the last one without internet when we were young. I was born in 83 and the uh, first computer came to my house in 94 or 95 around this. So I, I'm going to open it up to the others. I have some more questions, but I, I don't want to uh, take up all the time here. Mm -hmm. So uh, go ahead and just pipe up. There's a few of us here, so no need to raise hands or anything. Okay, I, I have a, a couple of questions for you. Um, you um, you said something that I, I've seen in other places to think that, that it's easier to conceive of the ends of the earth than it is to conceive of the end of capitalism. Okay, um, I have this love hate relationship to capitalism. You know, some, the, capitalism, the, the book definition is good, the practice that we have today and the way it's going is lethal i mean you know mm -hmm. it's literally literally killing us okay yeah. um 
but people can't think of it. They can't think of an option. My only hope is that people couldn't think of an option to the king ruling the country. And it didn't happen, and then, so here we are. And then you said something about um, lack of information or not being aware, not being aware of things. Um, so how would you, how would you fix those two? How would you teach people that there are options, to, uh, alternatives to capitalism, the waste practice, um, and that all you have to do is be aware of it and you know have things on the phone that will appeal to that. Or, what would you do? Well, what would I do? If, uh, I think this is uh, this is uh, where the governments come a lot to be able to implement new economies. But I think the first thing it's talking about it because uh, one of these days I was uh, I remember this sentence. I just said about the capitalism and the end of the world. And I posted it in my Instagram asking people, have you ever heard it? What do you think about it? And the only people who answered me back was to attack me. Nobody answered to support. It was, you're a communist. What are you talking about? Don't be such a fool. What the fuck are you saying? And sorry. And, and I was like, have you heard about Donut economy, circular economy, something else? Can we imagine something that is not 2,000 years old or 600 years old? Do we have another alternative? I think the answer, there are some brilliant people who already wrote things about this, but the, the, the answer is coming from our collective intelligence and trying. Here in Alto Paraíso, for example, it's already possible for you to deliver your, your, your recyclable uh, garbage and you get a coin from the city. And then you get this coin and you get to buy things at supermarket and the pharmacy. So uh, it's, I think we're going around that way, but it's the awareness that we have to give people that, that, that their minds are so closed. Uh, they can only see two systems. So there are like many other systems that have been proposed. And actually I have been, um, there is another thing that's really cultural, but I have been asked, I've, I've made a course of, um, sustainable economy and, and sorry compassion economy and uh, the girl that the teacher that she was teaching she started saying listen uh, since the philosophers from, from Plato until 1700 like the year basically making money out of money was considered a crime and a sin but then suddenly in the 800s it's like okay you're welcome take that out of the list of the sins there's no problem doing this. And this is when the thing like really split it. We had like rich and poor before, but we didn't have the, the people that were standing there just making money out of their money sitting down in the bank. That wasn't possible before. So how about we review this concept? We have been so many thousands of years without it. And now it seems it's the only possibility. So maybe we go also for the bank. I had a magic stick. Uh, what kind of profit can you make? Is there a limit? What kind of money can you have? Okay, I have $200 million. There's nothing else you can do with $300 million that you can't do with $200 million. So the maximum money you can have is $2 million and the rest we spread around. It's um, how we could work on that because we don't want to take away the possibility of a person of pursuing her dreams with the whatever money she made by herself, but it's okay to for one person to have that much. You can build a rocket and go to Mars. Yes, you can right? alone and be there. Say, oh, Earth is interdependent from Mars. I feel alone. <laughs> I think he already built his condo up there. Yeah, but he's bored, so he came back. You know, there's no fun there. And in the end, we want to have fun, everybody. And, and we depend on people to do that. And not just the 15 people, you, your friends, because they're going to get bored of them at some point. And, 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 and I know it looks like boring and fun, like things from uh, adolescents or something to say that, but that's our internal motivation. This is where we go. We go where our desire is. So what are we desiring? What's our culture telling us to desire and how we can look at that in this perspective of money? Uh, do I desire a world that everybody is cool? Yes. Who doesn't? <laughs> Did I answer your question, Max? Yes. You, yeah? You, yeah, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it was too much. <laughs> yeah. 
Eleni, I'm curious, you know, I, I was listening to you. First of all, just I, I'm very much in sync with you. I also teach collaboration. I believe that collab we are facing such enormous problems. If we don't learn to collaborate, we will be overwhelmed and it's going to be very bad. So we it's a baseline. We have to learn to collaborate more effectively. And that includes a lot of social intelligence, relational intelligence, emotional intelligence, somatic intelligence, we have to tap into our bodies, right? Mm -hmm. So I just, I was thrilled to hear you talk like that. It's, it's, I don't hear it from a lot of people. So it just makes me feel good that that's mm -hmm. also happening in Brazil. And um, one image that flashed in my head is, you know, when gas hits $10 a gallon, I think a lot of people are gonna get out of their cars and mm -hmm. physical proximity, you know, I live in California and everybody, there's more cars in California than there are people. And people, you know, they, they feel like they're inside their, these big, huge SUVs or Teslas or whatever, and they're really cool and they don't have to worry about anything else, but when it's too expensive to operate those, uh -huh. we're going to have to actually get close to each other. We're going to have to say, Hey, how can I help? Also land intelligence, you know, people who live in cities, they have no sense of, of what the land is like. They don't know where food comes from. A long time ago, I was uh, at a, something called Deep Ecology Summer School, and Catherine Sneed was there, and she was the founder of the Garden Project at the San Francisco um, uh, Sheriff's, uh, the, the jail, and the inmates were growing food, and it was having a tremendous impact on their life. And someone said, well, why don't people come and steal the food? And she said, honestly, because people don't understand that that's food in the ground, right? This, this is how disconnected we become. So um, I'm aware that Brazil is home to one of the largest indigenous populations on earth. And, mm -hmm. um, and I'm in the middle of reading Sand Talk by Tyson Yucaporta about indigenous thinking. And, and um, I'm curious if you know how that, uh, how the indigenous wisdom and that sense of being able to relate to each other is showing up in government, in community. What's, what's going on there in, in Brazil with all this? Okay. Uh, so there are two things happening in the same this moment in Brazil. First is a recus, rescue of this kind of wisdom. Comes a lot from spiritual movements and also now from psychology movements. So we're understanding as collaboration how they sit down and make decisions, how they divide work, and things like these are coming in the new uh, work um, movement now. It, it started from spiritualism. At the same point, the Bolsonaro government is killing everybody. The situation is pretty severe. Uh, five days ago, a 12-year girl was uh, raped and killed by three soldiers. And so the girl in the SDF, the, the Supreme Court of Brazil, said, I'm going to investigate. And yesterday, the whole village with the 24 Indians were burned down and they're all dead. There's this Bolsonaro attacking our people, our, the, the original people. And we are manifesting in the front of Brasilia since last year, November a big movement trying to get uh, some lands that they have. Bolsonaro is trying to get out of their hands now. So, and this brings a lot of pain, you know, and this pain, we, we, it makes us want more to research and understand how they live the collective and uh, what we can learn from them and from their medicines and from their rituals and from their concepts. I, it's so, it's, it's incredible when you sit down with one of them and you ask them, what's nature for you? And the kind of answers that they give, it's like, it's home. It's where I live. What's the ground? Is the ground dirty? No, they don't understand how a ground can be dirty and things like this. So you get a really bright and different perspective from their points of views and lives. So we learned a lot about their ways of um, collaboration. So um, I'm going all the way back when you were talking about your background and uh, you said that you started as a lawyer and I don't know if you know, but half of us on this call are lawyers. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are three, you and Doug and me. <laughs> <Guilty> <laughs> and, I, <is> <laughs> and, uh, and I'm wondering about your path from, uh, from law to what you're doing now and whether you're still involved in the law um, I've been to Brazil and I'm familiar with the systemic law, which is in no other place yes. in the world. Um, and so I just would love to hear you talk about that a little bit. Okay, that's nice. So my transition was basically, I first started in a really big office. And then I, th I thought, this is not, not it. 
I'm going to a really small office. And so I went to this six people office and it's really boutique. We were uh, uh, partners of uh, lawyer firms in New York. So we only had American clients and everything was in black stones and white orchids. And I wasn't happy there. I stayed there three years also. And then I said, okay. So I found another office where I could actually wear trainers and skirts, which is something that I love and uh, be comfortable. Like, because the other, this other one I had to be like, ooh, like high heels and all that, you know, dressing code. And I was working with movie and entertainment and then I thought, oh, well, this is gonna be fun. So I, I, it was for three years, but at some point I was as depressed as I was in the other places. And it was, a, it was kind of perfect because I could get late as much as I wanted. My boss didn't care what time I was in or not. Uh, as long as I did my job, I could wear skirts and trainers. People were like, nice. We had invitations for parties, for um, premiums of uh, cinema, movie theaters, concerts, everything, because we were working with uh, intellectual property. So this was the business of the office. And I was sad. I was going home working. That's like walking. Uh, from work which is amazing like in Sao Paulo it's a big city you can walk to work and I was crying every day and I'm like what's going wrong with me and so I I was talking to a friend and just said hey go make some coaching with this girl I made uh, some coaching sessions it was amazing and so I started talking to her and then at some point I, I understood that what she was doing to me was so beautiful because I got there it's like I'm going to open a flower shop I'm going to quit everything and open a flower shop. That was my idea, you know. Mm. And uh, so we started exploring my flower shop uh, ideas, you know, and what I wanted to do. And um, at some point, I understand I really love the transformations she was causing in my life. And so I said, I want to do what you do. And so I started studying. So this was the path. And uh, I never quit quit it completely law I still pay <laughs> to be a lawyer every year but um, I basically do my agreements and agreements from people around me but now I uh, last year I was looked for some uh, people that are creating a community villa so they're going to live together and they came to me and say hey you talk about collaboration and you're a lawyer you want to start making agreements for that and so this started happening now I'm in the second one and that's uh, where I got a lot in touch with the systemic law. So it's uh, really understand, valuable to understand the, the, the belonging, the, and I, I forgot now the names in, in Portuguese and in English, but understand the hierarchy of, of uh, rival and all this uh, things about the systemic, it's, uh, it's systemic law. It's really contemplating, um, it's like the law in Brazil doesn't has it's all about private property and the systemic law allows you to work in a collective place and not just defending the individual so which is the whole base the system yeah. base is that any specific question about uh, this that you wanted to ask or is this okay as an answer think, for you Kim? yeah if i yeah? wanted to know more about your path we should talk mm -hmm. about the contracts let's let's yeah. talk about it yeah. i'm gonna write my email higher here in the chat and also my oh, WhatsApp I've already, number. I've already, um, I've already. Uh, you already got it. Got it, and um, and um, and found you on LinkedIn, and uh, we'll we'll connect. Okay, great. <laughs> I'm waiting for it. Well, one thing that you said about the uh, the beaches being very democratic because everybody go, is there, but do they actually mix? Yes. In Rio, yes, this is the only place. Because in Rio, the best, the most expensive and best places to stay is by the beach. And then the favelas are just behind them. So right. they actually have the most beautiful site because they're in the mountain. And in the weekends, everybody goes down to the beach together. They are standing, there's no separation, nothing. No, there's no line, there's no, I'm in this bar, you are in that bar. It's everything in the same sense. There's nothing uh, dividing anybody. When somebody's throwing a ball, he goes to the other side. This the other guy yes. throws it back. Uh -huh. and, because that that's, that's what counts. You can be together. Um, mm -hmm. Like here, we have um, beaches that are very packed, uh -huh. and people find their little domain, put their towel, mm -hmm. and don't talk to anybody. Make you know, make eye contact with the sea. That's it. Mm -hmm. And they go out to the sea, and they they guide your children not to step on anybody. And, 
It's mm -hmm. like that. No, no, here it's a mess. It's really good mess. It's uh, warm. <laughs> it's uh, everybody sitting together. Then you're, oh, hey, hey, do you have a lighter? Oh, I forgot my charger. And someone is lighting you something. And then you're trying the person next to you, kaipiring us and inviting you to play Uno. Because we do bring gigantic Unos to the beach. I don't know why, but we do that. And, uh, <laughs> and also there's like a game that's called Outinha where you, you have to throw the ball from one to another just using the yeah. head or the feet. Uh, so this is like two people start playing and then you just go there and you join. So everybody's playing together. They say in Rio, you want to make friends, go to the beach. That's like impossible. If you want to be alone, at, like, put your headphones on, nobody's going to bother you. But uh, probably you go to somewhere that's not Copacabana or Ipanema. <laughs> you go to a place that's uh, more quiet because there it's all about this and there's people selling food and mate and it's fun. <laughs> a lot of people together. Coconuts. Coconuts. Mm, coconuts. Everything. They even, they even sell vegan burgers. It's just like everything, you know. <laughs> there is a guy that goes by with coffee, and a, it's, you can buy a coffee in a, in, a, in a cigarette. It's like a good pack that probably after lunch. Who sells coffee in the beach? In Rio, they do, you know. <laughs> so it, and he goes home like with everything sold. So uh, it's uh, creative people. <laughs> they, they even have a memes like Brazilians be like, oh, it's so hot. Yeah, let's have a coffee. I can we don't have coffee with ice like you it's just espresso you know so <laughs> I remember going for a walk to go have a coconut at this uh, at this little place just in the middle of town just in the middle of, of uh, Sao Paulo the person just chopped it up right there and we sat down and mm -hmm. had our coconut it was a uh, Pretty, pretty amazing experience. So I'm, I'm going to ask one more question, uh, Eleni, and then maybe we'll wrap it up. Um, one of the things that, as you were describing um, what you see as a future, one of the things that resonated for me mostly is your, your sense that it's going to come because of, of the need Mm -hmm. And that that it's it's the difficulties we're experiencing, the pressures we're experiencing, the difficulties as human beings and as an economy and as uh, countries and so on and so forth. And and then you said, well, it's awareness, um, and that what we need to do is help people um, gain awareness of mm -hmm. these things. Draw me a line between those two things because. Some of us feel it, some of us know it. You described it in, in your work where after mm -hmm. a year or two, you, you knew that you weren't in the right place. Um, but, but there's a lot of people like the people that replied to you when you posted the meme about um, capitalism. They obviously don't feel it. They don't know, they're not making, they're not drawing the line between why they're unhappy and the things that are causing that unhappiness. Mm -hmm. So draw me that line. What, what do you think is that conversation to drive people towards that awareness? I think it's, um, that's, a, that's a really good question, if only I knew. <laughs> but um, I think it's, it's very a movement of, um, first of love, that you have to understand that everybody is in a different movement of transition. So for me, something is obvious, for you not, and I cannot think you're stupid because of it. Like, and when you're thinking about this kind of awareness. So first thing you have to check the level of awareness. Uh, in the Buddhism, we say a lot, uh, a good way to get into somebody's um, understanding is asking them what kind of benefits they see from acting like that. And after the, the, this person brings the benefits, she thinks it's good acting like she's acting. And you can ask her, uh, show her another way and what's the impact. So I think it's individual conversations with a lot of love where you have to break this life, this 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 um, um, bridge of relevancy i don't know to make people understand that the individual is important and everybody's action is going to count and the food you, you eat comes from here 
you know, and understand what's being involved in all of these uh, processes of the things that you get ready. Maybe invite them to go to a farm, maybe to see, watch a movie. But I think it's something that's made with a lot of progression because in the end, we already know everything we got to do and we don't. Like, we, we try, right? <laughs> and, and we try with the things that you know. Everything I know, it's like, okay, so now I cannot use a shampoo in a bottle. So now I have to walk around with my own cup. So now I have to buy a different kind of a thing for my menstruation. So now I have to, you know, and, and you keep learning and you keep adopting that. But still, there are so many things we don't see. And imagine the people with less awareness than us. So uh, it's, it's, it's an understanding. We, we got to understand it's going to be slow. That's why I think the, the future is catastrophic. Uh, but we're going to get there at some point and, and keep trying um, to, to do that with example. And I, for example, I, I have many friends that some of them work with sustainability. I'm the only one who brings a cup to the parties so I don't keep using recyclable and they work with sustainability what can I do it's like and then you ask them and it's like oh I try but I always forget so we try and we keep trying and at some point we're going to try better and uh, do our best and love ourselves in the in the process because when we understand that the amount of things we're doing wrong it's really easy to you know not love yourself anymore and that that's not we need that kind of love presence and uh, going around. That is a beautiful way to end the mm. conversation. Thank you mm. so much for your perspective, because I think we've had a lot of conversations. And one of the things I really enjoyed about our conversation today is that uh, you, you bring not only a different perspective uh, as someone who's younger and has been involved in this from a different perspective than, than many of us, but also from the fact that you're living in a country that has a, a very different view of humanity and lives in a very different way. It's, it's in nowhere perfect, but uh, it's certainly different than the one that most of us get to experience every day. So thank you again. And uh, we hope to see you again. Please feel free to invite others to this conversation. Feel free to uh, interview them here. Now that you've been interviewed, you can, you're welcome to join the party and uh, invite others to be interviewed as well. And uh, thank you again. Thank you very much. You were so great that I even forgot I was nervous. <laughs> <laughs> it was really good to spend this uh, time with everybody, get to know you, Ken and Kim. Please get in contact if you will. Doc and Matt, you already have my phone, so... <laughs> Let's uh, get together when we can again. And Jose, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really happy since we connected the first time. Every time I, I learned something from you and I'm really happy to be here. Mm -hmm.